grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to everyone. It instructs us to renounce ungodliness and, un and worldly passions and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives in the present age as we await the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our great, and God, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. He gave himself to us to redeem us all from the Lord. To redeem us all from lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds, speak these things as you encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Amen. Amen. Lord, I thank you for this day. Um, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the ability to um, stand up here and just tell people about your word, Lord. Um, let me speak clearly and. Let your word flow all together as it does, and let us all get what we need to get out of it today to bring to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. I'm going to read two portions of scripture back to back, and then I'm going to contrast it with another piece of scripture. So if you guys want to open up to Luke 24, we're going to be reading verses 44 through 53, and then... Get ready to flip to Acts 1. We're going to read 1 through 11 right after that. Luke 24. Then he had said to them, this is Jesus, These are words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus is it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with the power from on high, the ascent altar. And he led them out of, as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and, retur and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Here's the rest of the account in Acts 1, 1 through 11. The former account I made of Theophilus. Either way, this word that is used here in Acts 1 is loved of God or friend of God. So this is who he's talking to. Hopefully all of us saved in Jesus Christ. So the former account I made, um, those loved of God, you loved of God, of all that Jesus began, both do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given the commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many, infallible proofs being seen by them during the forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, and this is Jesus again, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put into his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all of Judea and Samaria, and to the and to the end of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these things, while he watched, while they watched, rather, he was taken up, up in a cloud. The cloud received him out of their own sight. And when they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men by them in white apparel, who said also, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you in heaven, will so come, in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. 
So we see a couple of things how God went up at the end in this ascension, in this first coming. I want to reflect that off of a scripture real quick. You can go to Revelation 1.7. Revelation 1 7. And keep in mind the tone and the differences of how these people are feeling. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And the even so, amen is for the glory that comes after, but mm -hmm. for all those people that are going to be seeing him, they're not going to be happy to see him. But we are happy when we see him. And why is that? You could turn to John 14, and we're going to read 1 through 4. We're not supposed to be troubled. In fact, it says exactly this. Jesus speaking. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwellings. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, I'm sorry, and where where I go, you know, and the way you know. So we're not supposed to be troubled even further than not being troubled. We're supposed to have comfort of Christ coming. Amen. Yeah. So here we go. This is First Thessalonians 4. Verses 13 through 18. But I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, who are dead, lest you have sorrow in other, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him, those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we are that we who are alive and remain until the second coming, I'm sorry, until, I'm sorry, that was wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So there's a certain order in which um, we go up. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet our Lord in the air. Thus we we shall say always that then I'm sorry, thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So we're seeing a trend of comfort being told by Paul and Jesus about his coming. We see a totally different story in the second coming when he comes to judge the world, but he doesn't come to judge his people. We see actually in Let's read. Let's read Second Peter right now. I'm gonna swap it around. You can go to Second Peter four through ten. What chapter, Tom? Second Peter chapter four. I'm sorry. I think it's chapter three, but let me check. I might not have written it. Yeah, it's chapter three. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Is that what you're looking for? Well, since there is no chapter. Let me check it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wrote it wrong. It's chapter three. I'll just find it quick. It's going to be chapter 2, rather. Okay. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. That's what it was. All right. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. 
and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelleth among men, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from the day from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of the temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment, of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise and despise government, presumptuous are they, self willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Of dig yeah, dignities. Damn. So we see a total uh, two people. We're going to see one that believe the love of truth and one who won't. But God died for all of us to come to him. Not for a certain group. He died for everyone. Just not everyone comes to him. But we do see later in Revelation that people do come to him. And it's because of some of the things that he has to pour out on the world. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but I'll just read um, The Last Seal. This is the first series of judgments. There's seals, trumpets, and the vial judgments. Um, this would be the sixth seal, so that would be Revelation 6. Verse 12, these are some things that are going to come to pass after the Lord snatches us up. And I'll tell you the next scripture where he, where he snatches us up after this. And I looked, Revelation 6, 12, he opened the sixth seal. Behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. And as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wing. Then the sky received us as a scroll when it is rolled up, receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in caves and in the rocks and in the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Wow, that's a pretty big difference, right, from what the disciples are expecting. And that's because they're not expecting to face this. It's not for them. In fact, Let's read um, Hebrews 10. There's so many scriptures, too. I had to pick well, just an amount that I felt would kind of get this point across, but there is just a ton more that just prove this all in the Bible. You'd have to be looking at some obscure scripture to try to prove any of this not true in the Bible. Um, Hebrews 10, 32 to 39. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have the need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you receive the promise. For yet a little while, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And then we got Revelation 3. Go right to Revelation 3. I know there's a lot of skipping around, but it's worth it. Revelation 3, 10 and 11. 
Because you have kept my command to preserve, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no man, I mean, that no one will take your crown. And we see what's the point of that whole time. You can find that in Jeremiah 30, 6 through 8. I don't have it on here. But it's going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. It's for Israel to turn back to God, to give his message out to the world. Mm -hmm. Which we're going to read, well, maybe if we have time, which is the next chapter where I left off. I read Zechariah 1. We're going to be reading Zechariah 2 if I have time. And we'll just read right through it because it's what comes after all this. But let's, let's do one more, one more scripture about Revelation. And this one's cool because it shows the saints that are with Jesus when he comes back. In fact, before we read that, we're just going to reinforce it with, um, let's see. That's all right, I'll find it after if I have time. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 18. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. It's important, all these details, because you read earlier in Revelation about a different horse. And in the righteous he judges and makes war. So in righteousness he judges and makes war. So this is a righteous choice. His eyes were like the flame of fire, and his head were up. On, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew but except, except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Wow, that's a very different picture, right? Than what the disciples are expecting. In fact, the, the scripture for the, the saints being there will be right here in Jude, uh, Jude 14 and 15. So it's right before Revelation, you can find Jude. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with, tens, with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed, to, committed in an ungodly way, and of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. And then we'll finish with these verses in Revelation. Uh, Revelation 22. So the last one, uh, verses 7, and then I'm going to go to verse 20 and 21. And it's, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of the book, of this book. And then in 20, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. It's Jesus. Even so, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. And the, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And if anyone got to read Revelation yet, the pastor's going to be doing it shortly, you're going to see, through all these things, God pours out his judgment in a fashion. It's not just all at once. And you're going to see that some come to repentance. In fact, we're going to...
we're going to see a, a crazy amount of people that actually come to repentance. But that's the whole purpose. God wants people to come to repentance. God doesn't want to pour out his wrath on people. He ends up having to because they will not come to him. And they don't want the spirit of truth. They don't want it. So we see in Revelation, we see a, a whole fashion of how he pours out his wrath. And uh, it's all for Israel. And Israel's going to come up out of it. He's going to preserve a portion. And uh, they're going to do what we're doing right now for the rest of the, for the rest of eternity. From Jerusalem out, they're going to be preaching God's word and who he is. And uh, I think we have time. Yeah, let's go to Zechariah. So last time I was up here, I read uh, Zechariah 1. So it kind of works out. It works out that um, after all these things come to pass, we see this um, prophecy of Zechariah for Israel. I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof? And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I say the Lord will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saying, Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwells with the daughter with the daughter of Babylon, which is another picture we're going to see in Revelation. And thus saith the Lord of the host, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoil you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold... I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I have come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion, in the Holy Land. And he shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. So we see Jerusalem being measured for what's the new design, for what's the greater purpose of Israel in Jerusalem. And that's that there's going to be a lot more people in it. And Jesus is going to be there in the midst, ruling and reigning. And uh, that's where it all ends up. That's what God wanted from the beginning. He wants all to come to repentance. Not all do, but many do. And that God's willing to, to show us with these judgments that that's what some people need to get there. Mm -hmm. um, thank God we don't need those. We're already covered in the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So thank God we can look forward to his coming in the clouds to snatch us up. Um, that would be Revelation, well, we've read Revelation 3, but uh, I'll just read this one to you guys. This is right after we learn in Revelation 7 about the 144,000 Jews, and then we read this. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, and peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. 
blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So we see people come out. Tribulation saints. So God is just. He's righteous in everything he does. Um, even if it doesn't make sense to us, but praise God, he keeps us from those judgments because we're not appointed to his wrath. And uh, that's what I got for you guys today. Excellent. So hey, I guess I'll close in prayer. Hey, hey, Tom. Yeah, go ahead. You know what's kind of interesting? When you look at the verse that you referenced in Revelation 3.10, mm -hmm. right? So obviously that's the church in Philadelphia, the remnant church. Correct. Mm -hmm. And just, if you just look at it, it's only six verses later in the church of Laodicea, yeah. you can see just the contrast on how that temperature changes. Yeah. Just six verses later. So you go from being protected from the time of testing, six verses later, to being spit out. Yeah. Well, it's, why is that? Because it's of the remnant versus Laodicea. Well, what does the church stand for? Does the church stand for the word of God, what the Bible it's says, saving cold. people? It's neither hot nor cold. Yeah. What are we supposed to be doing in the last days? Mm -hmm. That's for another lesson. I didn't want to get into that. Occupying and sharing the gospel. We're preparing mm -hmm. ourselves and others for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the early church taught. That's what we're supposed to teach. Any other questions? No? All right, then I'll close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Um, Lord, thank you for the understanding of your word, and um, thank you for good teachers, Lord. We just pray that we could all take this word and go out with it and understand that, Lord, your prophecies about Israel that came to pass, we realize that we are in the last days. And, um, let that just be even more sense of urgency to let other people know about you, Lord, and what you did for them because you love them as you love us. Um, let's not keep you for ourselves. Let's be like Paul who poured himself out, Lord, um, as a living offering to you. And um, we all need to do better. We all need to try harder for you, Lord. And you know that we're weak and feeble-minded, Lord, and I just pray that you would just give us strength to uh, preach your word to everyone who needs to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.